All right, can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Um, I'd like to ask you if at any given moment during my talk, I start trailing off or you can't hear me in the back, just yell and I'll raise my volume. Um, before we begin, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here and putting this thing together. And they went just above and beyond in a few instances. So yeah, props to you. So welcome to this talk, Help the Hackers Get Your Data. So first of all, introductions, who am I? Uh, my name is Sergej Branac. I'm from Novi Sad in Serbia. I'm a consultant. I've been doing this for some 20 years or so. I run a small uh, consultancy agency, five to 10 people, senior soul. I'm an architecture and software consultant, as I said, and I make developers very uncomfortable and engineers very happy. I'm also a proud father of two beautiful girls. One is nine and uh, the other one is four months old now. When I'm not working or spending time with my family, I'm out and about with a dog somewhere, getting lost on a trail and having, having some fun. Now, because most of the conferences have a very limited amount of uh, input field with, uh, this is the full title of the, conf of the talk. Have the hackers if you want to experience some very, 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 very unpleasant things. And depending on whose da data you get, you might even face jail time. Yes. I'm a cynic, and yes, I speak sarcasm as a native language. The fact that I have been doing a lot of rescue projects where I have been exposed to some questionable choices by developers does not help the situation one bit. Now, let's manage expectations for start, right? If you're still searching for the answer of what is the difference between a junior and a senior developer, this talk is not for you. If you're expecting some kind of um, DevOps hardcore security talk, you will be disappointed, right? If you're working in fintech, there isn't a part of this talk that you haven't heard or you haven't used on a daily basis, and I truly hope you will be awake. For the rest of us, yeah, security and secrets management is important, but do we really understand what is the fallout of poor practices? And please take note that every time I say you, I mean we, because I'm right there with you, making the same mistakes and trying to be better. So we deal with um, too many secrets in our professional lives. Some are less, some are more sensitive, right? And we don't think about those things. Basically, here's the credentials, you shove them in your configuration file, and you move along, you don't care. As far as security goes, uh, your average developer knows about OWASP, XSS, CSRF, and that you should sanitize your input, right? We have conferences talking about code quality, about this and that, latest, greatest, whatever. We got um, talks about architecture, covariance, contravariance, about how to keep your co code under control and stuff like that. But people talking about the business consequences of poor security practices that go beyond basically, you're so screwed, not even once, right? On top of that, when I had this idea and I started talking to uh, C-suite people or VPs of engineering and tech and team leads, I had a great reaction. They were so happy, like, you should really do this talk. Yes, this is important. On the other hand, when I started talking to developers, I got, eh, it's not that important. That meant that I was onto something. I will be talking about secrets management while trying to take a look at it from a business point of view, right? This talk is aimed at developers who want to become engineers, which means you're going to have to talk a lot of business. And in this industry, this, sti this comes with a stigma of unclean, which is really a shame as you can learn a lot and uh, achieve so much more if you want to. The top, that topic is basically a whole new talk that is going to be coming next year to a conference near you. Shameless plug, sorry. <laughs> Hopefully you will walk out of this talk with um, new insights, knowledge, and actionable advice uh, on how to approach this subject and others. What I'm saying is that you will need to take off your developer's hat and put on your business hat. Because as GDPR came into play in 2018 and there was HIPAA and data compliance and certifications, suddenly a lot of people started getting interested and in caring how data is collected, how data is stored, and what happens in this case of a breach. And suddenly the cost of not handling security and secrets management just became too damn high. Now, 
We as developers uh, think and deal with cost in the same way we think and deal with security. It is simply not an integral part of our application lifestyle, uh, life cycle. Sorry. More often than not, it is an afterthought, and this is your first takeaway. This happens uh, thanks to the tunnel vision that is prevalent in our industry, where problems and fallout of this kind is a business problem and it has nothing to do with development and engineering. In turn, this is a mistake that can cost a lot of money because once and be sure that it will happen, it is just a matter of time, it hits the fan, you will want to be in a position where you just go shrug and not go into full-blown panic. When we start thinking about security in terms of cost and expenses, it starts to climb more and more on our priority list, right? And if you know how to talk to management and explain it to them, you will get their buy-in to deal with it. And later you will get their buy-in to deal and support to deal with a lot of other things you want to do because at that time they will know that you bring value to the table and they're going to actually listen to you. And this is your second takeaway. As some, hopefully a lot, of you know, sec uh, security is not a simple subject and it can be quite wide. For the intents and purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on um, one part of it, which is basically simplest to fix, but it can be a project or a company killer when mishandled. Excuse me. Because a median of 1,793 unique keys are leaked every day on GitHub. And as my friend says, please, please spread the love, right? Leak keys on GitHub, on Bitbucket and other services. I mean, why put your all, all of your eggs in one basket, right? Now, let this sink in. Give it some time, right? This is wrong. This should not happen, you know, but mistakes are made and all that, right? Let's try another data point. In the first six months of 2019, more than 4.1 billion records were exposed in data breaches. Again, give it a little time. This information needs to sink in. If you do mental math quickly, you will get to a, point, uh, you, uh, a number of 27 million records daily, right? That's a lot. But you know, is it really that bad? Why am I so pessimistic? I mean, let me put this in another way. This kind of data terrifies me, and it should terrify you as well. The fallout of these data breaches is long and strong. This kind of data points are what keeps me awake at night, going over the things that can be done better and making sure that they're not messed up. And believe me, code quality and technical depth are very low on that list. Because these things have an incredible potential damage to the business uh, in both costs, direct in and indirect. So what are the common ways of revealing your secrets, right? The short answer would be incompetence, ignorance, and hacking. Long answer would basically mean any, you leave your data store or database publicly available, whether it is Elasticsearch, uh, MySQL, Postgre, S3 Bucket, or you know Mongo, right? In all the cases, it means that some poor soul got the task to set it up, but did not bother with the security aspect of it. In case of Mongo, you know what? Um, you really don't care about your user data anyway, so authentication is turned off by default, so you get everything, everything you deserve, right? <laughs> and of course, we have uh, unauthorized access. Now, Suppose somebody gains access uh, to, to your server, and it can be done, regardless of your setup, which I hope you have. If you're running Docker or Kubernetes, I'm going to assume that uh, your container setup does not run, run under root, and you have the most recent version that has the most recent CVs patched, right? Now, if you have a dedicated infra or ops team, some, um, hopefully they will have monitoring in place with Nagio, Sisinga, or whatever they like. But if you don't, uh, I really hope you have at least this kind of tripwire in place. Uh, this is basically a simple script that is going to send you an email notification when someone establishes an SSH connection. Because the person who is going to access your server uh, will operate under the assumption that there is some kind of tripwire in place, and then once they log in, countdown clock starts, right? So they are in a race to, uh, to get as much data as they can, uh, which can then be filtered out later. 
So if you have your tripwire in place, you get a notification, you check with people who are supposed to have server access, hopefully not a lot of them, and if none of them is connecting to the SSH, then you can take steps to, pro to stop the bad actor for starter shutting down the server and then proceeding from there, right? So at that point, if you have your secrets and credentials in a config or parameter XML or whatever, you just handed the keys to your kingdom to someone because you were nice and hospitable. And in return, you're about to experience a lot of things and some of them are going to be quite unpleasant. From incurring a uh, cost for a security incident review by external consultants, via losing profit for the during the downtime of the review, uh, to losing your customer's trust, uh, to possible loss of sales and customers, and your bestest code and ideas will have nothing to save you from this. On the other hand, your attitude towards security and secret management might. Again, secrets, config files, parameters, YAML are really easy to commit and then weird stories might happen. So, first story. This is the story that I found just as I, I was about to start writing this talk when the idea materialized. So there was a person working on a project and they were using AWS and in all their glory, they uh, were hunting for the best of, uh, code and architecture. They decided to commit AWS unscoped IAM key, right? They committed it and pushed it to the repository. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? Some time has passed and they made the repo public by accident for whole 15 minutes, right? In those 15 minutes, somebody scanned the repository, got the keys that were committed and went along their merry way. At the end of the man, a month, uh, the poor soul that committed the keys got a $15,000 bill, right? Because someone had fun with keys that were available and they were hospitable. This is a nice chunk of change to, to, to burn down if you're not careful. At this point, AWS now has the billing monitoring and GitHub now scans for uh, IAM keys and as such, but back then, nothing of this, this was in place and it was a wild, wild west. On the other hand, this is a story that happened to me. Now, a setup. Um, imagine a system that has to process a lot of data daily and data has to be done by, be ready by 6 a.m. Eastern Seaboard time. That means that we are going to throw a lot of computational power at it to get the results we want and because we can paralyze the task, we can use background workers and, and yada, 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 right? So one fine day we get an email from Amazon uh, informing us that one of our keys have been caught in the wild. We check the, the logs and we check the, the system, turns out that the key has been deprecated six months ago and nothing is using it. Okay, we send an email to Amazon and uh, telling them like, this has nothing to do with us, everybody's happy, Amazon is happy, everybody forgets about it, right? Six months later, one fine morning, I get up, I make me some coffee, sit down in front of the screen and check the systems dashboard and I see that something is wrong, right? A lot of the counters are not sending the data and the counters that are actually sending the data are way above acceptable thresholds. All right, let's see what's going on. I log into the console and this is where the roller coaster starts. The application was leveraging spot instances as they were dirt cheap and disposable for computing power and mass. There are no spot instances running and to make things even more fun, the spot instance requests are also gone. I have some EC2 instances running. I cannot spin up anything new because I have no idea why this is trouble and this is going to be a long day. Now, I'm trying to contact Amazon support. I'm not getting any, any response. Time passes, three hours are gone. I have some three hours before morning shift starts coming in and they need to have at least part of the data ready, right? I call the CTO to inform him we have a problem, phone rings for a while and then sends me to, uh, to voicemail. I call him multiple times. It is as o'clock in his time zone, he's sleeping, he doesn't care, right? I'm trying to contact the Amazon again with my phone number, but they don't call as they don't have my, time, uh, my number on file, right? Time passes. It is noon, 6 a.m. Eastern Seaboard time. CTO is up, um, he sees the missed calls, comes online, we start talking, and this is where I realized that I just had a masterclass in chaos engineering. 
The email that was used for AW support is not something that he uses regularly. He checks it maybe twice a year, right? Took him about an hour and, or, or change to find the password. And then he found out that the AWS actually tried to, uh, to contact him, but there was no one to reply, right? So he contacts the AWS, clears it with them, another two hours pass. We are now in our eight of the outage. Information is now coming about what happened. So that key that I mentioned at the beginning of the story, right, where Amazon said it was fine, was for some reason flagged by back audit and AWS decided to protect us by blocking our whole account. And of course, they used the email on file to notify us, which is awesome. Now that everything is cleared, uh, the account will be restored in the next hour or so. Um, I ask about the spot instance requests and all the other missing things. No luck, they are gone. As the policy uh, of Amazon is to shoot first and ask questions later in cases like this. Next couple of hours, and this was on me, uh, I'm, I'm spending all uh, the time putting everything back in place because I didn't have it automated. So some 16 hours later, we are back in business and operational. Now, can anybody guess what is the damage? Just throw a number. Yeah, you really need to be less bashful. So $1 million in revenue for that day and daily wages for some 300 people who were prevented from working, but they are going to get paid, right? But yeah, you are more sophisticated than me, right? And more enlightened. And you're with the hip crowd and you know better, so you are using environment variables because awesome sauce, right? And you're using a .n file to set them all up, right? So you have your local dev uh, dot file and you have a uh, different dot, uh, dot n file on your server. So everything is fine. There is a chance of committing, but you can handle it with a git ignore. But still, people can do stupid stuff in production. I mean, what can possibly go wrong? Right? Hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to my world. Then again, even if you have your environment variables in unindexed and used properly, for a skilled person, they are really not hard to collect. And then again, we are back in the problem situation, right? But hey, we're using containers. Good for you, right? So now you're passing environment variables directly to your Docker engine, which then I could use something like this, not to mention the ever increasing mess that you need to pass more and more environment variables to your containers. For example, you can use a Docker compose file and it's going to start looking like this. And as this monster grows, how many hours are going to be wasted by keeping in sync with newly added variables with teams who have .n files? And better question, um, how secure is your way of sharing those parameters? Are you sending them via email or a chat client or how, right? But yeah, we're going to switch to Docker secrets. Yes, of course. You're going to tell me that you're going to use a file-based clear text located in slash run slash secret slash variable name. Yeah, please tell me more about security, right? Please. Even if you squint real hard and pretend that this is not an issue, you should keep in mind that some of the official images might contain vulnerabilities. And I'm sure that each and every one of you inspects those images before putting them to production, right? Instead of trying to play Pokemon because you got to have them all, right? Now, if you're working with a project on a project that has a dedicated infra or ops team and they let these kind of problems in production, you really need to have a long discussion with them, right? With business present, because you need to explain to them that they are making a lot of mistakes and that, that, is, that might cost a lot of money, so they need to improve, right? So now we need to take a look at consequences of these kinds of problems. Up until now, I've been talking about some concepts, but I still haven't used their names. So in case you don't know, and you might want to learn them. Here they are. So here's an experiment, right? Ask your boss to have company counsel or lawyer present and sit down with you to discuss what will happen in a case when your company gets taken to court and sued over data breach, right? And that you have to prove that reasonable security measures have been taken, right? And then when you start talking to, to the counsel or a lawyer and they ask you, how are your credentials stored? You'll tell them in a config file. 
and when they ask what does it mean, you tell them it's a plain, clear, plain text, right? So again, what does it mean? That means that anybody who gets them and gets that file can open it and read the set secrets, right? When you say that, sit back, relax, and watch the situation unfold as the information sinks in and as they start to freak out. Then you're probably going to be introduced to a nice term called criminal negligence. But you have insurance, right? And we are covered for that. Some of you might say, maybe if you're covered against cyber attack, right? Until again, it is time to claim it when you have to or determine the premiums where again, you will have to prove the uh, reasonable security practices, right? Good for you, right? When you, when you start explaining to the adjuster that you're keeping config and, uh, sorry, <coughs> credentials in config and Playtex, like, you got this, you'll prevail, sure. And then we come to certification, right? So specifically ISO 27000, right? Hopefully you work on a project that is going to require such a thing and you will get into a situation where you have a major client coming on board and they are going to ask you that you have this certification because they're bringing in a multi-million dollar deal. And then you're going to learn pretty fast that, thing, that security and secrets management are very costly. And this kind of certification takes a long time. So because you were uh, hunting, the, uh, going for the best code and best architecture and you didn't care about this, you're going to have fun time catching up. So this is why I'm talking about uh, cost and security together because more often than not, they are the same facet of the business. And this is the takeaway. The cost and the damage control, the maximizing of profits by not losing sales and decreasing liability potential, right? So now that we know how we ended up in this situation and why it is a bad situation, let's see how we can actually improve the situation. The answer is simple, by using a secrets management application. So what makes a good one? First of all, you want ease of setup and operation, right? Uh, that means that um, configuration should be relatively straightforward and not be ambiguous. You should also have a clear path uh, for upgrading to high availability solution or multi data center or whatever else you have, right? And the way your application uh, should interact with the secrets management system should be as straightforward as possible. Again, it is also a nice idea to have an expiring secret and your application should not care about this because all that it knows is one, once the, uh, the request has been emitted, fresh data will come in. On the other hand, ease of changes for your administrations or, or your team uh, that can implement new secrets is very important as you, are, uh, as you want them to be uh, as efficient, as, as cost effective as possible, right? And this is my favorite one, right? At first, doesn't mean much, right? But when you start thinking um, about dynamic secrets in terms of business, then suddenly a lot of options are open. Meaning if you squint real hard, right, all of your configuration va uh, values can be treated as a secret. And that means that they can be stored in a secrets management system. But then depending on the token that is emitted, you will get the different values back, right? which means that you ha can have a token for production, token for staging, token for testing, and all the values are going to have a different, uh, all the keys are going to have different values, right? Now, add on top of that, uh, the developer environment, which we talked about briefly, and suddenly you have a nice cost reduction and increased security because you will not be sharing secrets anymore with email, instant messenger, whatever, right? And you will not have any more the downtime with developers while they are waiting for somebody to give them credentials to access the new service. Do I need a really, really need to explain this? Just want to want to make sure because if you, if in 2019 you get don't get this part after all the GDPR talk, you're beyond redemption. So I'm sorry. Now, choices of backends, uh, where you can, I mean, it really, it really is nice to have a system where you can choose whether you want to use your local, local storage and that's encrypted or you want to use RDBMS or you want to use AWS or any other cloud provider solutions. That, that greatly increases the value of this system because you can then tailor them to your needs more, more easily. Now, let's be honest here. 
we all like the cost to be close to zero, right? This is, of course, impossible, but what we can do, a uh, what we can do is to keep them down, and I mean keeping them down a lot. By having a straightforward installation and configuration, your team will spend less billable hours on these tasks. Again, by having something like dynamic secrets, um, your setup is going to be simpler, your team is going to be more pr productive because there is going to be less uh, development downtime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'm good. Um, right. So, secret management systems are nothing new. They're, some of them have been out there for a long time. This is just a small selection of them. You can use whatever, whatever fits your barrel. Some of them are very good. Some of them are very weird. Some of them actually require you to recompile them and redeploy them when you change the secrets. I never understood that, but fine, to each his own, right? Uh, whenever I can, I like to use the software that is backed by a company. And because AWS is everywhere, we cannot escape it, so we got, we're going to take a look uh, briefly at AWS Secrets Manager, which I think is one of the three tools that they have that basically do the same thing, right? This, this one just has the more, most uh, straightforward name, right? So AWS Secrets Manager, Manager is uh, their native way of, storing, of securely storing key value pairs. It has some rotational ability, but outside of RDS, you essentially have to write all of your own. And also, it, is a, it was a single region only. I'm not sure if it's still there, but you know. Again, if region lock is not a problem, there is a bigger potential issue, and that is the price, because it can widely differ depending on your usage. So first example is basically a production scale web application. Two SSH keys uh, per server, five database credentials, yada, 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 nothing special, and it costs six bucks a month. Not bad, right? Now, let's try this with microservices. Five million secrets uh, that are valid for one hour, two API calls per secret per month, that is almost $3,000 a month. That's a lot of money. And this is usually the wild ride you will have with AWS because costs are like, meh. The other t tool you're going to hear is basically HashiCorp Vault. Um, if you're talking about uh, infrastructure and, and secrets management, this is the, the, the tool that comes up because it is, I think, part of Kubernetes as well, and still be, it, was, uh, uh, it was brought by the company called HashiCorp, which gave us Terraform, Vagrant, and other fun stuff, right? Oh, this is almost not working. So why it is a good fit? Because it is a small binary that you install, the configuration is relatively uh, straightforward. And with the use of certificates, you get a nice secured HTTPS transport for your secrets. This can be done by a single developer or a non-dedicated infra person. On top of that, you have high availability uh, mode that if you need right out of the box, or you can scale it up to a uh, console or Zookeeper solution. Uh, the ability to select uh, from multiple backends is of, is, of course, a plus, which means that you can tailor it to your needs again better. And then we have this thing, which I'm hoping I will not butcher this time, so I apologize in advance. Shamir's secret sharing algorithm, right? Uh, this is the default algorithm that Vault uses, and it basically uh, allows you uh, to securely share the keys in a distributed manner, which means it is going to take your primary Vault storage uh, key and split it up in parts, and those parts are called shares. Now, for the secrets to be unlocked, you set how many shares needs to be present at any given time, and that is called a threshold. Now, what that means is now you have an elegant solution to unlock, uh, unlock and prime your vault and secret storage, even if some of the, some of the shareholders are, are unavailable. For example, they are some, some, someone is on top of some mountain with a poor reception and they, you can get to them, but the server has been rebooted for what way. So you have somebody else who is going to come up and uh, enter his key and things will work. <clears throat> also, what is very important to note is that Vault operates exclusively in whitelist mode. Uh, Vault has this thing called policies, which is basically an ACL rule, right? You have a root policy that is built in and permits access to all of the resources. You can create as many policies, as many named policies as you want, which means you can fine grain uh, your control over the paths. This is important to clarify because uh, unless any of the policies explicitly grant access to a resource, the action is not going to be allowed. 
Since the user can have multiple policies associated, again, this can turn quite messy and you need to be very careful about it. So, everything should be awesome, right? And this is, yay, great. But things are not as good as one would think. So, two problems that come to the surface right away is basically sealing and unsealing the vault. Um, how are you going to master the, uh, how are you going to manage the uh, master encryption key shards, meaning the shares, right? Uh, what is your process for unsealing the vault in the event of failure? Uh, where are the keys? Who has them? Uh, what is the procedure in, uh, in the event of catastrophic failure or something recovery? You need to think about these things and sometimes it can be uh, quite complicated, right? The other thing that, is, that comes, uh, that is maybe more prevalent is basically HTTP calls, right? This one might be a downside for somebody, but I'm certain that for 90% of the people this is not going to be an issue. Uh, sometimes, yes, your network can be over text and then you're going to uh, encounter latency, latency, but you know, you can fix that and deal with it. Unfortunately, if you are in a situation where your network cannot be improved, being a um, security-minded business person, on one hand you have this performance hit, on the other hand you have this uh, peace of mind and knowing that there is a less chance of a potential loss, I think the choice is clear where you want to go. Or if you really want to push it, uh, you should really use HTTP2 and then all this overhead goes away. So, how does it all fit together, right? The Vault token goes into the configuration. Ironic, I know, don't get me started. The token gets sent to the Vault server and the client token is returned. That is basically your cookie on a website, right? Once the retrieval of the secrets is uh, granted by the, uh, by the ACL, uh, then you can, once the ACL grants the access to the secret, then you can retrieve it, sorry. And of course, when the lease on the client token expires, Vault token is used to obtain a new one. In case of breach, your tripwire system is triggered. Your files are downloaded, possibly configurations. You remove the server from public. You rotate the token that is generated. You rotate your secrets. You rotate whatever you need. You update the config. You make the server publicly available, and you move along. So uh, a question is, would you use a secret management on every project? Um, I go through a list like this. So if I'm using, if uh, we are storing user data, personally identifiable information, yes. Are we using or storing any kind of uh, sensitive data? Yes. Are we uh, storing any kind of payments or on the system? Definitely yes. So I go through a list like this that gives me a yes or no outcome. If I'm in a position to make this decision, I'm going to make it. If I'm not, I'm going to take it to the management, explaining to them the problem and I'm going to recommend it. They might go that way, they might do their own, own cost-benefit analysis and decide that the outcome is not worth it, which is perfectly fine, more props to them. I would, like just, I would just like to get in signing that they decline, so it, when it is covered your rest time, I'm ready with the audit trail. So, in with the potential drawbacks using uh, Vault or any other, any other secret management tool pays off a lot is your company and your product will be protected from unwanted liabilities and in case of actual unauthorized access, uh, your configurations will be stored securely. Because according to the IBM security research, <coughs> sorry, uh, average cost of a large data breach in which more than 1 million records are exposed or lost in 2018 is $3.9 million. Now, if you remember from the start, we were talking about that in, in first half of 2019, daily there were 27 million records lost, right? That means 27 times 3.1, 3.9, right? Uh, these are, this figure takes into the account many categories of the expenses that arise from the breach, including lost business, technical investigations, legal penalties, PR companies that need to handle the mess, and employee time spent on recovery. With all this in mind, I believe it is significantly cheaper to invest engineering time to solve this low-hanging fru fruit than let it run its deadly course. The end. Thank you. Any question? <coughs> Anyone else? Hi, thanks.
thanks for the talk. Uh, you were talking about the uh, Ansible Vault in the in the uh, some of the the, yeah, and the list of a, applications. Yeah, there was a mention here. of it, yes. But uh, from what I I use it uh, for deployments, but uh, it's not like a. Um, it's just storing uh, yes. encrypted things. It's, it's not the same as the, the one you described later, I, or is it something I missed in the in uh, Ansible yes, Vault? Yes, I agree with I agree with you. Yes, the Ansible Vault was mentioned, and the idea for Ansible Vault is to store the the credentials securely, so you're protected from your developers. Yeah. But I put it inside because I actually saw it. People use it as a secret management yeah. tool, so I was like, yeah, okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of weirder solutions out there, so yeah. Thank you. No more question? Okay, so thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. Thank you.